the scripture this reading, or sorry, the scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 7 and 33 through 37. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, And there he lets the hungry live, and they establish a town to live in. They sow the fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. All right, so we are diving into week two of our series um, called Wonders of God, where we are looking at various wonders in the Old Testament narrative. Um, this past week, uh, I have had the opportunity to, to start some, some pre-marriage counseling for a couple um, that I'm going to be marrying this fall, um, and we, we, we started our, our first session together. And, and one of the topics of conversation um, from the, the curriculum that I'm using was about dating your spouse, right? Um, so when you get married, you just like stop dating, Right? No, right? We, we all agree that you continue to date. And, and one of the things that, that we talked about in, in pre-marriage counseling that I wish someone had told Aaron and I um, is if you don't build the habits of good dating now, you will have a hard time in the future, right? Anyone ever told that or should have been told that? Because right? if you start building positive practices now, you'll be able to continue those practices later in life, particularly when things get more challenging or difficult or you get busier or your jobs get harder or you have more kids or or whatever it might be, right? But so often we tell ourselves, whether it's in romantic relationships, whether it's in our jobs, whether it's with our children, whatever stage of life we're in, we always say, well, when this happens, then I'll do this, right? Well, when my job gets less stressful, then I'll start working out, right? Or when I get a promotion, then I'll be able to save for my retirement, right? Anyone else? The grass is always greener, right? It always gets better tomorrow. Now, I'm in my 30s, and I would tell my 20-year-old self, that's not true, it just gets harder, For those of you who are older than me, does it get easier or harder? Harder. Okay, I'm just going to assume that's true from having conversations. Maybe when I'm 80, anybody? 80? Like, does it get easier then? I don't know. Probably not. But but the the people of God, in, in biblical narratives, it almost seems like they have this sort of like, well, when... Well, when we escape captivity in Egypt, well, when we reach the promised land, well, when whatever happens, suddenly things will magically be better. Now, there are periods of biblical history where this is true, where they step, that, man, that girl is angry this morning, isn't she? Uh, when, we, when we step into new places or new territories, things are peaceful for a moment, But our lives are not a continual incline getting better. In fact, our lives look more like a roller coaster. Places of hills and valleys, places of highs and lows, places where we feel like we are just alone and isolated and other times where we are filled with exuberant joy. 
And so the people of Israel are much like this. She's done, I think. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> so if we, if we hearken back to the end of the Torah, or to the end of the Pentateuch, which ends in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy has this hard, kind of unimaginable twist. And that's, they have not reached the promised land, right? The end of Deuteronomy, they have not reached the promised land. What else happens at the end of Deuteronomy? Somebody's super important kind of croaks. Moses, right? Moses is dead. They're not in the promised land. It's kind of a downer, right? Like ending the, these first five books of the Torah this way. And so we hear about, about Moses' death, and then a new leader is going to pick up where Moses leads off. And there's this theme kind of going forward in in the rest of these books that that God's love for Israel, expressed through the covenant promise God made with them and throughout all these marks in history, that God's love will continue. No matter if they're on a high, high, or a low, low. God will be with them. God is among them. The end of Deuteronomy is not the end of the story because we pick up in the book of Joshua. And Joshua kind of takes that baton from Moses and leads the people onward, ready to arrive in the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Now, some, um, some scholars believe that the book of Joshua and the book of Deuteronomy were at one book at one time, um, and they later got kind of split, so you could kind of end Moses and then pick up the book of Joshua. Uh, and a lot of people believe that it's kind of a similar author who, who's writing these narratives. So, um, so you can't really read them as separate books, all right? They, they, they belong together because they're a continuation of one story. And so Joshua is the guy who takes over for Moses to lead the people on to the promised land. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying the book of Joshua, if you've ever read it, um, it's a really hard book to read. Not because it's like, I mean, it is filled with some kind of big hard words, but you can just skip past those, right? Uh, but more thematically, the book of Joshua is hard because at, right from the onset, as they, as they reach the promised land, they have to go into the, into the land of Cana, the land of milk and honey, and, and the text kind of calls for like this a total annihilation of all the people who are there. It's almost like a mass genocide. Now, there's some conversation that, well, the, the, what happens in the book isn't historically factual and, and all this kind of arguing back and forth, but either way, that violence is, is very present and very real in the narrative of Joshua. And I want us for a moment, um, we're not going to talk about violence in the Bible because that's like 20 sermons all at once, right? Um, But I want us to, to kind of put that aside for a moment and say that there is ways to move kind of over this and under this and through this and around it to kind of help us get to a, a place where we, as people of God, can learn and grow in faith through this narrative. This really is an issue uh, that, that's extremely complex. And I want us to remember that the violence that's here is not a prescription. And it's not a way to, to justify war. Maybe it's just what happened. There's some things in the Bible that are just there to tell us what happened. Does that make sense? It doesn't necessarily mean that that's how we have to act. They're there to tell us a story. And what we do with that story, through the grace of God, is what matters. 
So let's set the scene for our text today. Um, our text is going to be from, from Joshua chapter 3. Um, so two whole chapters have happened in Joshua after Moses has died and Joshua's kind of taken over. Um, and so right before we get to our text, these two spies, um, you know, they're kind of they're seeking out what's going on, right? Like they want to know what the promised land is like. So, so they send these spies to go look. And, and these spies have returned from Jericho, um, having followed Joshua's orders to kind of check out the land and the city. And they'd escaped being discovered. Uh, remember Rahab? We talked about her last year. Rahab helps them, right? And so they give their report to Joshua, right? This is very militant in action, right? Like, hey, spies, go out, seek out, come back, report. And so... Um, In Joshua 2.24, it says, The Lord was handed over the entire land to us. Everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. So the spies report that the people in the promised land, the people who are already there, are worried because the people of Israel have arrived. And it says God is going to hand this land over to us. Now, this is the news that that Joshua has been waiting for. And so he starts to kind of dispatch different people to do different things around the camp. And they they start to announce that the next morning, they're going to go to the banks of the Jordan River. And there they are going to pitch their tents. They finally come to the place where they can reach the promised land. And so at the start of chapter 3, it says, early in the morning... Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. So at the start of chapter 3 of Joshua, they've gotten reports about what's on the other side of the river, and Joshua's like, all right, let's go, team. We're ready. Ready for battle, right? Just ignore that part. Uh, (laughs) And so they go, and they, they pitch their tents at the side of the Jordan River. Now, I've been to the River Jordan, um, and my memory of it kind of serves as like a a muddy stream of sorts. It's kind of deep. Uh, It's it's not super, like, rapid by any means. Um, but, But the narrative in Joshua kind of sets a different picture for what the Jordan River looked like at that time. Um, Now, I don't know anything about, like, landscapes change. I'm not a scientist, right? So I can't tell you what it looked like thousands of years ago. Um, But but the biblical narrative gives us um, some information. In in verse 15 of the the text we're going to read here in a minute, it says, The Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. The gentle Jordan was was now a raging river swelled to the flood stage. And, and it's reported historically that currents could reach up to 40 miles per hour when the Jordan River floods. What's more is that the plains that surround the Jordan River are also kind of packed with this tangled brush and dense growth. In Jeremiah, that, that prophet reports um, that there's these, there's these thickets around the Jordan. One writer has said, it's not the river so much as the jungle that's difficult to cross. So that's the scene. The Jordan had swelled up. It had spread about a mile across. It was about three feet to 12 feet deep in some places. And there was all this thick undergrowth and this overwhelming current. And this is the site that greets the multitudes of hundreds of thousands of people that pitched their tent alongside the river. And the Bible tells us that they, they spend kind of three days there. And they start to wonder, how are we going to get across? Now, it's not just an army that's crossing, right? It's the whole people of Israel. I mean, if this were my family, I'd be like, Aaron, we're not crossing. I'm not taking that baby across the river, right? It's scary. They don't know what's to come. Do you remember how the Exodus, not necessarily the book of Exodus, but just the Exodus in general, the Exodus from Egypt to the promised land? Do you remember how that started? Parting of the Red Sea, right? There's that initial parting 
of the Red Sea, where they're, they're fleeing Egypt, they're fleeing captivity into freedom, and God parts the Red Sea so they can walk across. The entrance into the promised land happens in the exact same way. The story is bookended by partings of seas or rivers. So let's read Joshua 3, 7 through 17. It says this, The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. Do you hear that? This is the day I will exalt you, Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that I will be with you just like I was with Moses. The Israelites knew that God was with Moses because of that parting, right? The parting of the Red Sea. So this was a proof to the people of Israel that God would be with Joshua. Sorry, people running slides. I know I messed you up. All right, verse 8. It says, you are the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. And when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, uh, or excuse me, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the, the Girgashites. I wrote phonetically what it is. I'm having to catch myself. The Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. Now hear that. The Ark of the Covenant, the, this kind of gold-plated box where the, where the tablets of the Ten Commandments supposedly dwell, that's going to pass before you. God's going first. God's going first into that river. So now I want you to select 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. When the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan flowing up from above shall be cut off, and they shall stand in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross the river from the Jordan, the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan, it overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zethrian, while those flowing towards the sea of Araba, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all Israel were crossing over the dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing the Jordan. This is the word of God for the people of God. So God says to uh, Joshua, I'm going to do this so the people will know that I'm with you just like I did with Moses. And then the Ark of the Covenant is going to go first. God's going to go first into the river. And then it says, where does the Ark of the Covenant go? Does it just lead the people through? It stays there, right? God stays and waits in the midst of that treacherous journey across these flooded, tangled banks. God is there right in the midst of all of it. And the whole point God tells Joshua, who tells the people of Israel, is I'm going to do this so you will know that among you is the living God. So you will know that among you is the living God. Friends, when we go through these highs and lows and deep valleys of our lives, there are often wonders of God that surround us. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been in the midst of a river 
that suddenly the river stopped flowing and it parted for me. Anyone been there? Okay, I'm good, glad we're on the same page. But there are other wonders in our midst. Whether it be a tragic moment of our lives, I remember when, when Emerson was just five months old, um, we, uh, we spent some time at Children's Mercy because she had RSV. Anyone else have difficult bouts of RSV? Yeah, it's like terrifying, right? You're sitting there watching your child and they're talking about possibly sticking a tube down their throat to help them breathe. And it's one of the most panicking, terrifying times of your life. At least it was for me. And I remember sitting in her hospital room and we're, we're trying to figure all that out. And in walks a professor from my seminary. A professor that I had never had class with. A professor that didn't even live in Kansas City. In fact, he lived in Oklahoma. And he showed up in my hospital room. Well, Emmy's hospital room. It was an awe moment. Someone showing up that didn't even know me. Just to be there and pray for my kid. Anyone else in hard times have people show up for you? Those are wonders of God. That's how you know God is among you. But we have to open our eyes and see it, to latch on to it. If we think about Joshua, Joshua was kind of this scared boy. Over and over again, God had to say to him, do not fear Joshua. What's the famous line from Joshua that everyone always remembers and writes on cards? Anybody? It's on a lot of graduation gifts. Be strong and courageous. You heard that phrase, right? Be strong and courageous. Do not fear. Throughout Scripture, God proclaims to God's people, do not fear, I will be with you. There's a long list. It says it to Abraham, to Hagar, to Jacob, to Moses, to those f- fleeing from slavery in Egypt, to Gideon, the judge, to King Hezekiah, to the psalmist, to the community of Jews who are about to be exiled. It says it to Daniel, to Mary, to the shepherds, to the disciples who are caught in the storm, to the disciples who are frightened at Jesus' death, to the Apostle Paul, and even to John at Patmos in Revelation. This is the story of the Bible. This is the story of our faith. That God is with us and God is among us. And that's why God loved us so much that he would send God's self to walk with us as Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. God with us. The people of Israel do eventually reach the promised land. And they live in a short time of prosperity, right? But then the next kind of big moment in biblical history is exile. It goes from good to bad. Just like the patterns of our lives. We have high highs, and low lows, but wherever we are, God is there. Let's pray. Oh God, I thank you for the wonders that you provide to us each and every day. I thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace. God, as we stand along stormy, treacherous rivers, whatever obstacles might stand in our paths, whatever fears might overwhelm us, God, allow us to know that you are there forever and always. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.